welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Stratford-upon-Avon. On tonight's panel, Rachel McLean, the government's safeguarding minister at the Home Office and former transport minister. Before entering politics, she worked in banking and co-founded a publishing company. Nick Thomas-Simmons, Labour's shadow international trade secretary, MP for the Welsh former mining area where he was born and raised, and author of biographies on Clem Attlee and Nye Bevan. Anne Bowden, tech entrepreneur, chief operating officer of Allied Irish Bank following the 2008 financial crash, now boss and founder of the online only bank, Starling Bank. Businessman, chief executive of commercial property investment company First Property Group and former Brexit party MEP, Ben Habib. And a railwayman for nearly 30 years, he left school at 16 to work as an electrician, then in construction, and is now General Secretary of the UK's biggest transport union, the RMT, Mick Lynch. Good evening. Welcome to my panel. Welcome to our audience here in Stratford-upon-Avon and welcome to you at home. Thank you very much for watching and do join in the conversation on social media at BBC Question Time in the usual way. OK, let's get started. And we're going to start unusually with two questions tonight, one straight after the other. Let's have our first one from Samantha Marklin. Do you, the RMT, think it's fair that whilst the whole country is suffering a cost of living crisis, that they can disrupt people's working lives and subsequently their income. And <laughs> and Sonia Sangera. Why do public sector workers continue to be disrespected with measly pay rises and villainised by the government for demanding what is fair? <laughs> the obvious first person to go to is you, Mick. Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, fairness is a difficult one. I understand the disruption and the inconvenience and the anger that our dispute and our industrial action uh, will have on the people of Britain and on our communities, and I understand how they feel that it, it's not fair. I do understand that. And we don't want to be on strike. We don't want to take industrial action. Our members are ordinary men and women from up and down this country in every community virtually, including in this one in Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, and they're railway workers who are tired of the way they're being treated. Now, we were lauded as heroes by Grant Shapps, our members. They worked all, way, all the way through the, the pandemic. They were not furloughed and they kept our railway and transport systems going, including the buses and the maritime ferries that serve our communities and indeed in the offshore oil and gas industry. But what they're being told now as a result of that is that you're out of fashion, you're out of date. Somehow the terms and conditions that we've negotiated uh, over many years, which we think are a fair deal, and we think that every British worker should benefit from terms and conditions such as the ones that we have, such as limits on the, the amount of unsocial hours that we do, limits on the amount of weekends that we have to do, and agreed negotiated uh, pay, rate for the job, so that you're not just subject to the whims of the market and the way that the economy is going at that particular time, so that you can depend on a secure income and a secure job. And if you fall on hard times, if you get seriously ill, you'll get sick pay and you get an agreed amount of holidays. We think that's what every worker in Britain, in every business, should have. But what we're faced with now is a clampdown, and it's a deliberate clampdown by the government. And we're, they're using COVID the temporary phenomenon of COVID, albeit an extended one, as an excuse to rip out and strip out terms and conditions. OK, well, and we we've have seen a member of the Asia government here. Make sure we put some of these points to Rachel. Uh, so I think the uh, first thing to say is that the government doesn't want strikes. Um, and I think strike, we don't need to have strikes either. What we do need to do is ask Mick and his team to come back and negotiate with, with Network Rail so that we can prevent strikes. And there is obviously time to do that as a pathway through that. And um, Mick's right to talk about terms and conditions, but the, the terms and conditions that he's referred to are not the ones that the industry needs to discuss with, with Mick and his colleagues. The railway needs to modernise. There's a set of proposals from Mick's employers, and that needs to be worked through in detail. Some of these terms and conditions have been in place, as Mick says, for a very long time. Every industry needs to change. The railway has changed. The truth is that we are down about 20% of passengers. 
So, of course, there isn't the revenue coming in. Network Rail doesn't want to cut jobs at all. That's not the way forward. But there is a sensible pathway through this where Mick can get what he wants and the travelling public can get what they want and get back to work and get back to doing what they need to do on the railways. Let's hear from you. Man there the um, Mick, the question I wanted to ask you is, you told us everything that led up to this. What more could you have done to have prevented this? Mm. And what do you regret that you didn't do? Well, we've been speaking to these employers for an extended period. Ever since COVID came down in March 2020, the government contacted us immediately and convened emergency talks with ministers, the same ministers that the Tories say I won't speak to. I've spoken to every transport minister in our sector. Uh, and they said, we want you to work with us to run the railway and run the bus service and the ferry service in particular so that we can keep key workers going and goods moving. And we did that. But immediately after the first peak, they said, you're out of date, your conditions have got to go, you're too expensive. And what the problem with the railway in this, this hang country on, hang is... Hang on, that's not, in fairness, that's well, not the question you're being asked. Yeah, the I'll question you're being that. asked is... Well, do you, so we've been working with these companies on all of these issues and we're working with them right now. But the prescription they're giving us is too much. They're saying to my members in, in Network Rail, for instance, you must work 39 weeks of nights... 39 weeks of weekends at night for no increase in wages. And in fact, in some cases, the railway is saying to our members, you must have less wages going forward, not just against inflation, but against the, the existing salaries. And you must take a prescription that gives you extended working hours without compensation, five additional hours per week. Now, we have been working tirelessly... But, Mick, the question being asked yeah, is, I'm what do you there. regret not doing? I regret that we haven't got a government that will allow okay, the that's companies a different, that's to negotiate That's a different answer. Let me come us. to Ben. Ben. Well, well I, I think, regret I think, that we had um, not been able to make an agreement. We've okay, been working right. with them tirelessly to get that agreement, I, that's but it's not there at the Not moment. what the person was asking. Ben. I, th I think I'd like to step back, if I may. That, you know, getting caught in the debate over this particular strike is missing the issue, if you don't mind me saying so. What we have here is a much bigger economic malaise which is first playing out through the rail service. What we've had, and I'm going to have a crack at the Conservative Party, if you don't mind, Rachel, forgive me, but what we've got in the Conservative Party is a party in governance that's taken us back to the 1970s. We have a party that's governed this country for 12 years. National debt is up to 100% of GDP. Taxes are at a 70-year high. Inflation is at a 40-year 40, 40 high. These figures and these records haven't been breached since the 1970s. And when you, when you govern an economy like that, what you get is close to no growth. And surprise, surprise, GDP in this country in 2010, when the Conservatives took over, was about £2 trillion a year. It's now £2.2 trillion a year. And if you look at wage growth in the public sector, which is particularly pertinent to Mick's position, it's gone from £555 a week in 2010 to £585 a week in 2019 before the pandemic hit. It's actually dropped since then. So you've had a 5% increase in wages in the 12-year period that the Conservative government's been in charge. And you've had inflation over that period before the current spike of 9%. Before that 9% spike, you've had inflation of 25%. So, actually, I'm going to come right to mixed defence. What we've got is a failure in macro management of the economy. We have had real deflation in wages of 20% across all the public sector and, indeed, the economy. So, Mick is first out of the gates, but we are going to see strikes from British Airways. We are going to see strikes from the teachers. We're going to see strikes from all those people we clapped for during the pandemic, the NHS. And, 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 and the government could have headed this off. You know, this is not a necessary problem. You look at the United States. It had all the same problems we've had over the last 12 years. Their GDP has grown 50%. Ours is stagnant. It's because this government is a borrow, tax and spend government. It needs to cut taxes. It needs to cut regulations and it needs to have a vision for growth. Okay. Woman here in the front. Yeah. 
Um, Rachel, going back to what you said about how the government doesn't want strikes, to my mm. knowledge, this is not. This was not an unknown issue. The government knew that these strikes were coming. Um, to that, I say, why would the government? Why was Boris Johnson at? A, sorry, why was Boris Johnson at a Conservative fundraiser on Monday, auctioning off dinners with himself, uh, Theresa May and David Cameron? If he knew these strikes were coming, why did he not sit down with rail leader, um, rail union leaders, and people like Mick Lynch to? come to a solution before all of this kicked off. Let me, I'm going to get round oh, okay. the I'm going to get of round course. the a little bit more and then I'll come back to you. Yes, the man at the back in the blue shirt. Yes, that's you. So, with IT enablement and working from home, the railway's business model has changed. You know, it can't rely on captive commuter traffic, it can't rely on high value business travel. It, it needs to, to, to look at a different economic model and, and that means change as well as investment in the, mod, in the railway system. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with what the gentleman has just said. I think, from what I've read, the, um, the railway rules and um, all that goes on is very draconian. And to be perfectly honest, what, one of the main three pillars that Mick Lynch is um, asking for is for no forced redundancies. I'm sure there are many people throughout their careers here who've had... Um, redundancies due to changes in working models, their companies, and that is not realistic at all to, to want the government or to want the railway to say, we are going to agree that there are no forced redundancies. And by the way, Mick Lynch, did you get, get here by train today? <laughs> Blue polo shirt, yes. I am a railway worker and um, I work in the station ticket office. And since for the last no, 12 are you, months. Are you a member of the, the I RMT? am a member of the RMT and I was on the picket line this morning. Right. And um, I, my concern is that it's not just the people in the offices, it's all our vulnerable passengers, it's um, the safety side of things that we do in the ticket offices, and the government on a wholesale closure with no plan in place to what our job role is going to be, or what's going to happen with us, and it's, it's just really frustrating. I've never known morale so low in a job. And what do you make of the, the, the lady's point at the back, where she says, the, I, having no, insisting on no compulsory redundancies, it's a fact of life for, for many workers, why should you be any different? It's, 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 we I'm understand not saying that. it's pleasant, obviously, Look, but she's just saying it's a fact Obviously, we understand the, the, the situation the country's in, but the problem for us is that we, need, we are needed, on, bodies are needed on a railway for safety reasons, if nothing else. And surely the railway is an essential service and it needs the bodies to run an essential service. And it's, if that's not going to happen, you're going to end up with the disasters like the rail track stuff that happened in the 90s. So we can't... And, uh, I'm just concerned. Fiona, they it, told us they can achieve this. No compulsory redundancies. But they're not being allowed to. They could give us this commitment. Mean? The companies have told me, face to face, they could achieve a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. Yes, so why don't you um, negotiate with them on that basis? Because they won't write it down on a piece of paper and give it to us as the commitment. It is. But they... got... It's here. No, it's not. It's I thought is. you That's didn't interfere in these negotiations. I've, I've but you've had got the a network le rail letter. I've got the network rail letter here. That does not give us... OK, none of us that can does read not it. Give us so do you want to read out the relevant bit, Rachel? Well, will you read out where well, it, it says... it doesn't say guarantee Well, look, someone read it out, for heaven's sake. Rachel, you've got it. Will you read out the relevant bit? There, we, when the changes are implemented, our need for maintenance and work delivery staff is likely to reduce. We will need to commence formal redundancy consultation yeah. with is, our trade that unions. Is compulsory no, it's not. Again, while we do not have to agree those redundancy with our trade unions, we would much prefer to implement them with your agreement and cooperation. We very much hope and anticipate that sufficient employees will volunteer for redundancy to avoid the need to make anyone compulsory redundant. So That's say? your it's not a guarantee. Does it say there's a guarantee of no compulsory redundancy? It's very clear. Does it say no compulsory redundancy? No, of course it doesn't, because well, as the lady said, no, no organisation can give that guarantee. But you Network can see Rail here gave in, us that guarantee for 12 years on the top. You can see here in black and white, it says they want to do this with your agreement. And yeah, if, if you want to negotiate with them, you can That's protect the jobs of that gentleman over there. It doesn't say there. what you said it said. Well, I, what okay. I said it I said... I think we're going round. <laughs> And and round here. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen. But the left hang on here. You said it said no. Hang on, Nick. Anne is busting to come in. 
Yeah, um, my father was a member of a trade union and um, my first week coming to London for my new job, he said, the first thing you need to do is join the union, protect your conditions. And therefore, I have a lot of sympathy for the trade union movement. But I think we need a far more sophisticated response here. It isn't just guarantees of, of you know, job savings, it's transition plans. What are we going to do to make the railways a even more high-tech industry? And what do we need to do to retrain people and give people a path? Um, you know, the, the, the key workers, you know, the people on the front line during the pandemic were out there where the rest of us are working from home. I think we actually need to consider that uh, when we plot the future of these industries. I, well, I agree with okay. you. I agree right. with you entirely. Well, let's, 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 let's so we go through that transition with a guarantee of no compulsory redundancy and we can start a deal. Right. It doesn't say it on that document. But you... But let, hang on a minute. Not, let, let, hang on a minute. Let me, let me bring in... So if they said it to you, why quietly. don't you go back and negotiate with them? Yes. I'll come back to you in the morning. morning. Nick. Good. Well, I have to say, Rachel lifting, lifting that letter is the first finger I've seen lifted by a government minister to do anything to resolve the dispute. <laughs> and I've, I've driven here from Wales uh, this <clears> evening, <throat> and there is no dispute between the Welsh Government and Transport for Wales. And there isn't a dispute because the Welsh Government sat down through its social partnership approach, it put the time in and it actually bothered to find a solution. But it was also a 3.3% agreement, whereas the RMT are after 7%. Well, there's also an issue around conditions as well, which I'm sure Mick uh, can speak to in a moment. But the point is you had an active government taking responsibility that wanted to prevent strikes from happening. You just haven't got that with the Conservatives at Westminster. Uh, Grant Shapps won't actually even pick up the phone and speak to the RMT to try to deal with this. And it is, I'm afraid, all of a piece with this government at Westminster. Try to get a passport. You can't get a passport now because of the backlog. You want a driving licence, you can't get a driving licence. You want to fly somewhere, your flight gets cancelled. There's the cost of living crisis and the squeeze. And what's the great idea of this week from the government? They want to increase bankers' bonuses. This is a government that is completely out of touch. I mean, well, the the, 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 out the of government world. is saying that's not what they're doing. But, yeah. So when you were listening to, to the gentleman in the audience there, you were on a picket line this morning. Would you join him? Or would you support Labour MPs standing on a picket line with that man there? Well, I am focusing on, and that's why I haven't uh, been joining the picket line, what I am focusing on is firstly at Westminster exposing the failure of this government to lift a finger to prevent these strikes from happening. And what I will continue to do at Westminster is to try to make absolutely sure that we pressurise the government to get around the table but and solve the strike. But it's not just about I back, I, I back a deal. And, and listen, my, my father, uh, who's retired now, was a steel worker. He was in the steel strike. He was off for 14 weeks. I know exactly the sacrifices that strikers go through. I know exactly the disruption that is caused by the public. That's why I didn't want to see the strikes happen. The government should do more, and the government should now be resolving this situation. Well, I, I mean, I completely agree with Nick that actually the Prime Minister missed a golden opportunity to invite Mick in and, having a, ha, and have a chat with him. But this is, this is about fundamental governance failures. It's not just about negotiations. It's not just about conditions and pay. This is about a breakdown in a government that doesn't know how to handle its own policy of lockdown and how to emerge from it. When we came out of lockdown, what we experienced was a supply shock. We had uh, a price of fuel going through the roof. We had supply chains across the globe broken. And the Prime Minister and this government had no plan for that. Instead of making it easier for the working classes and for the middle classes, by reducing taxes on them, they increased national insurance. The private sector had been kicked in the shins for two years, and they want to increase corporation tax rate. Small, and we haven't talked about small and medium-sized businesses, by the way, who I think, and sole practitioners, who have suffered much more than anyone who has the comfort of employment. You know, they have been driven out of business because of business rates, but no okay. one talks about that in government. This government, before you get around a negotiating table, needs to assess how it's going to grow this country, this, the economy of this country, and how it's going to make people wealthy again. So it needs a the woman there, you were nodding your head to that in the blue shirt. 
Businesses have to change, they have to adapt. It's a fundamental of yeah. being in business. You absolutely have to change with the, what you experience economically. So do you think the RMT is taking the wrong approach? Yes, and look what happened to the dinosaurs. Well, they were around for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> They're not with us now, though, are they? million years. Okay. So, but we are I... negotiating change. We deal with change all of the time on the railway. We apply technology in ticket offices, on board trains, in rolling stock, on the delivery of traction power. We deal so, with Mick, change we've all got of you the here, time. What about we Mick, why have we got you here? Uh, what about some of these things? And, and uh, I don't know the rights and wrongs of this. So the network uh, rail chief executive, Andrew Haynes, has said, he said, for example, one of the things he wants to change and, and that you're not allowing is that maintenance teams Maintenance teams are responsible for geographical areas. So, for example, if you have a maintenance team who's at, who are at King's Cross Station, they are not allowed to go to Euston Station, which is just a five-minute walk. Is that right? Or? But it's, it's right because they are two different regions. And the, but they're the five re minutes walk well, away. You listen, the regions of the railway were constructed by private companies and the assets and equipment on them are entirely different on each region. We have digital timesheets and manual time. You wouldn't be surprised that if you're out on, uh, on the ballast in Inverness on a February, you may not have a computer with Mick, you, you that use manual just doesn't timesheets. Fly. That's, that's a, a company. That's an absolutely Victorian attitude. We are not. How on earth we are not that 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 Because it's a different area. What? People it's just can't true. go the from Victoria to Charing Cross. That's just. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let, let, Mick, let him talk. Hang on. Yes. But it's an absolutely ludicrous, unworkable situation. I employ 35 people. We have to change with what, with what the so, customer demands. So do we. It's hope. So no, do we. You, you clearly don't, Mick, because you've got people in Charing Cross unable to maintain Victoria. It's a ludicrous situation. <laughs> Mick, I will come back to you. Let me just hear a bit more from the standards. audience and then I'll not, give you a chance to respond. Not our working practices. Yeah. Yeah. No, we won't. You will be the death. No, Look at the railways now. Utterly hopeless. Terrible places to travel in. Yeah. You've got customers crashing out left and right. You've got a 20% fall since the pandemic and you're still demanding more. You, yeah. You're demanding twice as much as you, you, is on the table now. You've got a three point whatever it is percent offer on the table. You're demanding seven. You're demanding the guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. How utterly ridiculous is that in okay. 2022? Let's hear from the railway worker in our audience. What's your response to that? Uh, my issue is, is that the reason it's so fragmented is because of the franchise system. There's too many, there's 15 or 16 toxic and network rail. How are they supposed to communicate when they're all, you know... Who wants to hold the country to okay. rest? Yeah, but, okay, okay, on, yeah, but the thing hang is, on. it's completely no, unacceptable. On. Hang on, we've heard you, thank, thank you. you. But let, let's let someone else no, speak as well. The thing is, if it was nationalised, all under one banner, then you, you, you can do those things, but you can't do it. You know, oh, okay. It's like going into Sainsbury's and doing something at Asda, you can't do it. And that's oh, the way it works on the, it that's the, way the franchise system works. OK, let's hear from the man here in the front, the blue shirt. What's wrong with compulsory redundancy if you are redeployed? Well, we're seeking a redeployment agreement and they won't give us one. So if people are displaced because of organisational change, which we deal with every week of the year, we can get a redeployment policy and get people different jobs in different uh, fields and different uh, roles. What we need is an agreement to do that. We haven't got one. What they're saying is you must accept all of the change without negotiation, virtually, and you have to accept any redundancies come out of it. What we're saying to them is give us the guarantee, secure our members' jobs, we will accept the change as it comes along and we'll talk about it and negotiate it. We negotiate change every day. We used to have 400,000 members. We're a much smaller union because the railway has shed jobs due to technology. All of that has been done under the banner of no compulsory redundancy and people can choose to leave the industry when they're ready or they can choose to go into a new role. That's what we're after and that's been the arrangement in the railway for a long time. There's nothing wrong with those values and if all companies had those, we'd have a better society rather than dumping okay. people on the dole at the behest of private sector companies. The woman at the back in the, in the, in the very middle, yes. Stratford Avon played host to Rail Live today and yesterday. It's like the largest railway expo in the country. It was empty because no one could get there, which I just think is completely ironic. 
It's a place of innovation and technology, people coming together to discuss how the railway can come together better. Mm -hmm. And yet, where was everyone? No one could get there because you were using archaic values and striking. Okay. Let's hear from the, the young woman at the, in the front, in the, in the white top. Um, I'd like to go back to Rachel's point about how the government doesn't want strikes. Um, following the news today that British Airways workers will be striking over the summer, surely the government could have prevented these strikes if it had not supported fire and rehire? So can I just say that that's completely wrong to say the government does not support fire and rehire. In fact, the government has legislated to prevent fire and rehire. The British Airways dispute that you've just mentioned is a private matter. British Airways are a private company. The government has got nothing to do with British Airways. We very much hope that they will resolve that with their workers. I'm sure that they will. I think they've got some experience of disputes with their workforce. Of course, they need to negotiate that. That is not the government's job, to negotiate with British Airways and their staff. OK, let's hear a little bit more from the audience before I move on. Yes, the man there in the grey jacket and grey shirt. Yes. yes I think the main thing that we're seeing now is that conflict doesn't solve anything. Transformation solves things. Now, I agree that we need better worker rights, but we need that across the board. British Airways is going to evolve. There are airlines that have come over from the US that have come to the UK and are more efficient, they're more effective, they're cheaper. Now, that does not mean less jobs. It just means everybody needs to get together and actually transform the railways. That means investment from government. It means workers actually getting what they need. We've heard from a guy there that knows what the problems are. Fix the problems. Stop talking about it. OK, let's hear from the man next to you. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of effort gone into the PR campaign from both sides. We're using the public as a judge and jury. Mm. If you'd spent half the time just sitting down around a negotiating table, we might be somewhere. OK, yeah. and let me just take a last point from the man here in the cap in the front. If um, Boris Johnson called a snap general election and the Labour Party won a landslide victory, how would the Labour Party prevent strikes across multiple industries that are being talked about and threatened? If you, want to, if you want to know what Labour would do in power, look no further than Wales, where Labour is in power. And what Labour has done in power in Wales is to have a social partnership approach, getting trade unions, uh, getting employers around the table and hammering out solutions. No, it's not, it's not uh, glamorous. It's not something so we're out on the media. Nick, so the teachers you that are threatening, to, go on, or threatening to, to, to hold a ballot, would that not apply to Wales as well? Well, well, but the Welsh government... It, it would, wouldn't education it? Education is evolved to the Welsh government, so the Welsh government will clearly have its... and does have its own education policy, and, of course, we'll see how that develops in Wales. But my point is this. The Welsh government is an active government that brings people together to stop but strikes. It doesn't react... No, it doesn't react by saying nothing to do with us, which seems to be the position at Westminster. But there's a fundamental problem here. Costs since 2010 have gone up 35% and wages have gone up 5%. You know, you can't yep. square that circle. So no, no, no amount of sitting around a table is going to get you over that hurdle. No, no. You need proper policies. Absolutely. That, you know, we've got a real issue with the cost of living in this country. I, actually, I don't think it's a thing. It's not about wages. It's about getting the cost of living down. We are a highly regulated, and I've come back to it, it sounds like I'm banging a drum, highly taxed economy. And I'm not talking about reducing taxes on the rich. I'm talking about reducing taxes which are regressive, that hit the working classes, small and medium-sized businesses, reducing okay. those taxes, generating okay. growth. We're not getting out of this without growth. No, you made that point. Uh, absolutely. Briefly, Nick, uh, you asked me what the Labour government would do. We'd have a strategy for growth. The short term, what we should be doing is VAT from energy bills. We should be cutting business rates, by the way, to help those yeah. uh, small businesses. The national insurance rise is a profound mistake. And then we need a strategy for growth and investment we should be investing £28 billion each and every year on the transition to net zero, the renewable energy that we need, okay. the home insulation that we need. Whole, whole but above yeah. all, a strategy for growth is precisely what this country needs and why this government is failing. OK. Sorry? There was another question from yeah. Sonia, the disrespected pay. You feel free to answer it. So, I mean, Sonia asked that question, and it was about public sector workers. And I, I think public sector workers have been done down for a long time, not particularly the railway. I'm not going to go on about that. But there are a whole strata of people in this country that have been subjected to this form of austerity for an extended period. Uh, what is it, nearly 12 years now, that have had pay suppressed. 
And if that's what it's about, it's about making workers cheaper for, for the government. And that can only go on for so long, and it causes disruption in the society, it causes people to be alienated from what they're doing. And, and when the government says, if, if, if they keep... I'm going to say this for you, Rachel, since you're sitting quiet, quiet as a mouse. If the government says, if, if we give large um, increases in, in public sector uh, uh, wages, that would drive inflation up? Well, inflation's gone up, and the problem is that prices are chasing wage, uh, wages are chasing prices, not the other way around. We've had a lot of people, whether in the private sector or the public sector, all in small, small businesses, who've not had a rise for a very, very long time, and they're starting to really feel the pinch. We've got a society where people in full-time employment are having to take state benefits, and some of them are having to go to food banks. That cannot continue. We've got care workers and other workers, not just nurses, and everybody talks about nurses, but all sorts of people in the public sector, in the councils, who I think are completely undervalued, and they've, they're starting to think, I need to stand up and get some dignity at work so I can get a better standard of living. And that means some of us that are doing better may have to give up some of what we have and transfer it to them through some kind of government mechanism because it's not right. That means progressive tax so that people earn a decent living and have a decent living to live on. I think we need to understand where this cost of living increase is coming from. And I think I, you know, people talk about the wage uh, sort of spiral. I think at the moment, um, inflation is not being caused by wage increases. What we have at the moment is about 80% of inflation is caused by energy, fuel, food. And 20% is coming from um, uh, the supply chain issues and the fact that a lot of people haven't gone back into the workforce uh, post-pandemic. So what we really need to do is, you know, the, the Bank of England raising interest rates won't actually solve this sort of inflation. What will we really need at the moment is concerted effort to get the food out of Ukraine to resolve some of these supply chain issues. But in the meantime, Anne, the government could have reduced tax on fuel, no, no, which you, is fast. You've, no, you've I've made the it, point I've, many times about reducing tax. But, but, then we hear. But, Just let, but, let's but, hear but, from yeah, Anne. Hang trick. on, let me hear from Anne. Yeah. So, so I think we have a situation where, you know, sort of, we need to be really understanding what's happening. And all the talk about 1970s um, sort of pay, pay spirals and, in, uh, and inflation is yesterday's problem. You know, it is 40 years ago. Right. It's we back. have a very, very <laughs> different problem. But this nowadays. is what you're clear. And this we is need what to the have relevant measures. measures. The, the, this, the, you know, trying to sort out uh, strikes such as the RMTs to their satisfaction will spark a 70s uh, inflation spiral. No, you're no. saying that's not the case at no. all? Well, let's talk about the food bank then. Because we're seeing more and more people coming to our food bank in Stratford upon Avon. It's not just food poverty, it's now fuel poverty. And it's the first time for years that we're now seeing less and less in the warehouse to give out mm. because people can't afford, when they go shopping anymore, to drop a few tins into the food bank basin at, in, in the supermarkets. So what happens now when we haven't got the food to go and give to these individuals? It's drying up. Rachel, we haven't heard very much. Yeah, You've got no. Matt here saying, saying the government hasn't got a strategy. You've got Anne here saying that linking um, rising inflation to wage inflation is, is false. And you've got um, Mick saying, actually, not valuing workers. OK, well, where to start? I think the first thing to say is that we are living in very difficult times. We, we all know that. These are global pressures on our economy. As people have said, we have a war in Ukraine that is affecting the food supply. We've also come through the pandemic that has caused a supply shock, as Anne has said. So these are global factors that we are seeing all over the world. It is right that we have a responsible approach to this as a government, which we do. We do not want to go back to the 1970s. We don't have to go back to the 1970s, by the way, either. And, and that is why we have put in place our strategy to deal with the cost of living. I think people know that we have put a lot of 
support into people's pockets. The, the, the huge sums sometimes don't mean anything, but it is but something about, like it is something like £37 billion, pounds, and it's targeted at those people on the low income. But what about the point made by like, the woman in the red dress who's shaking her head at you there, saying, mm. well, what about, what about the, the people coming to the food bank? Yes, and that's, that's what I'm getting to, because I, that's what, those are the people that we want to help with the targeted support that we are giving Which those people. The, so the, if the help it comes so. from, from the finish? British public... Yes. who graciously I know. go into supermarkets and donate food into the baskets. Without the British public, we don't have that food to give out. Yes, and I know that. And so I work, the government I, aren't helping us. So, I, and I'm, I work with my local food bank, and I, I absolutely understand those pressures, and everybody is feeling the pinch. Of course they are, which is why the government has stepped in to put the money into people's pockets through the energy bill rebate, for example, through the household support grants that people can access. Because people have very different situations. Not everybody is the same. People have different pressures. So we are working with those local councils who are very close to their communities, who know what they need to get that funding out there to people. So I don't think I can address all, all the points because I know that other people want to come in. But I think the basic point I would make is that we do need to keep control of, of the economy and we need to keep control of inflation. But we absolutely value public sector workers Rachel, don't let anybody control. tell you inflation that, is don't out let of anybody control. tell you that inflation we, is out of control can i just finish yeah. you've had quite a long time don't let anybody tell you that we this government does not value public sector workers that is completely and utterly wrong we have paid people's wages throughout this pandemic we paid furlough well, we we've kept money in people's pockets through businesses, we paid businesses, borrowing, grants to businesses. Borrowing in spending. We, okay, then well, I mean, that. can you just let me finish? How else are we going to generate that? We've had a global pandemic. And by the way, we were the fastest country to come out of lockdown because of this government's policies. We were the fastest government to roll out the vaccines, which has helped our economy to get back on track because of our Prime Minister's leadership. <laughs> right. We've got inflation currently sort of 9, 10, 11 per cent. We got public sector, we got the um, uh, universal credits and help for pensioners uh, being sort of announced this week where pensioners are getting 10 per cent. You've got private sector pay increases at say four or five per cent. What's happening to the public sector? What's happened to the NHS? What's happened to the people that haven't actually had these pay rounds yet? Those are the people we have to worry about. Okay. We could talk about this the whole programme, couldn't we? But actually, lots of you asked other questions, so I feel it is my duty to try and address some of those. Before I do, I just want to tell you where we'll be next week. Uh, next week, the programme will be coming from Inverness, and the week after that, we'll be in Barnsley. That's the 7th of July. So if you are from or around Inverness or Barnsley and you'd like to be in the programme, do apply on the BBC website to Question Time, and we would love to see you there. OK, let's take another question. From Vanessa Lewis. Would Dominic Raab's Bill of Rights as he claims, strengthen our UK tradition of freedom, or would it, according to the Law Society president, make some human rights abuses in the UK acceptable? Nick. I think this is a profound mistake from Dominic Raab. This, first of all, the, the ECHR came about after World War II, when countries came together to try to make sure that there was a universal standard that related not to countries, but just simply related to people, to humans, to try to come out of that horror of the war and build that international consensus. And I thought it was shameful to see the party of Churchill, one of the architects of it, actually trying to trash that in the House of Commons this week. There are rights that people have that they've exercised, and since 1998, of course, in the last Labour government, you can exercise those rights in the UK courts. I think of victims, victims of rape, who have been able to enforce their rights against police and get uh, justice. I think, for example, of couples in residential care homes who've been separated against their will, but have then been able to rely on the ECHR for their rights, or even Families of disaster victims like Hillsborough have been able to use uh, the ECHR to enforce their rights. And it's what a about profound cases, mistake from Dominic Raab and frankly about, this government Nick, What about it. cases where it's perhaps slightly less comfortable? So, for example, and you'll be familiar with them with your, your, your legal background. In 2013, judges ruled a man who took part in the gang rape of a 14-year-old girl in a playground couldn't be deported to Jamaica because um, he'd fathered two children in Britain. 
Are you comfortable with that aspect of it? Of, of, of course, with any court, they, the court will make decisions that we disagree with. The difference between me and the Prime Minister, when decisions are made by the rules the Prime Minister doesn't like, he goes and changes the rules usually. What I accept is there will be decisions of that court that I won't agree with, but I accept it because it is the greater good for victims who are able to enforce their rights. Ben. Well, I, I, don't, I don't actually believe what Dominic Raab is saying. I mean, I think that is... Oh, you think he doesn't it, mean it? No, I don't think he means it. He's playing to the Conservative Party base. There is no way the government is going to turn its back on the European Convention of Human Rights. It's baked into the Trade and Cooperation Agreement with the European Union. It's also baked into the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So he would have to breach two international agreements if he wished to di ditch the ECHR. And we all know Northern Ireland, um, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite uh, prominent in that fight. Northern Ireland is right at the forefront of constitutional debate at the moment. So there's no But the way... government's not saying they're going to ditch it entirely. No, the, just ECHR, the ECHR and the debate about it in, in, in the Commons recently and this new idea to dilute it down is uh, an excuse for their Rwandan deportation policy failing. And it's, it, it's to really blame the ECHR for the failure of that jet, which I think only had one deportee on it, taking off for Kigali. Actually, the ECHR it did, it didn't did take off. It, did it didn't take off. take off. No, but it didn't. But there was only one deportee on it when it was when chocks were away. <laughs> and actually, I think the ECHR saved us four hundred thousand pounds for a wasted flight. This is all window dressing, playing to the Conservative Party base. I'm afraid. Okay. The man there in the check shirt. As an event planner and a local businessman, the uh, we're heavily dependent on people's disposable income and the cost of living crisis is crippling us at the moment. I would like to uh, ask Mr Habib what he would do if he was in government to reverse the trend of this cost of living crisis and what he thinks the government should be doing and what the time frame should be so we can start to see a reversal of the trend. If you'll forgive me, we, we actually moved off that topic onto another one. So forgive me, what a you, shame. you didn't get a chance to make that point before. We're actually now talking about the European Court of Human Rights. Yes, the man at the very back. Um, the Labour lawyer breached, uh, undermined our human rights by voting for the Surrender Act. Hang on, what are you talking about? Human rights. You're talking he, about the Brexit legislation? Yeah, the Surrender Act, he voted for that along with Keir Starmer, which breached our human rights as far as, as, far as leaving the EU. But on top of that, that has undermined the human rights of the Northern Ireland people because they have no say in their laws. What about their human rights, sir? Well, they, well the Human Rights Act, the ECHR, is embedded into the Belfast Good Friday they Agreement. Have no it's say on their it's, laws. That, that, that is fundamental to the peace in no, Northern no. Ireland. No, they, have no say, the they have no say on their laws. OK, let's hear from the woman in the front here. We have seen that the government take what they want to hear as the word of everyone. The UK courts have said that the flight was able to take off to Rwanda, disregarding the human rights of the people or the person on that plane. The ECHR said it was a violation of human rights and they held the government to account for their actions. If we scrap the ECHR to whatever extent, who will hold the government to account for human rights abuses, no matter how small or how significant they are? Richard, who will hold this to account? So, I want to start by being clear that we are not leaving the European Convention of Human Rights. What's been introduced by the Deputy Prime Minister is to rebalance our system so that we have the right to make our own laws and stop the over-expansive interpretation of our sovereign laws that we make in this country in our own parliament. And I know this is against the backdrop of Rwanda, so I might as well address that, because the, the key here is that no court, including the highest courts in our own country, found that the government was doing anything illegal about the Rwanda plan. And I think, if I may, just, uh, just speak about the Rwanda plan, because this is a very serious issue. We are trying to solve a global problem here of illegal migration from around the world and we have seen incredibly dangerous journeys people dying in the English Channel losing their lives they are at risk of these absolutely grotesque people trafficking gangs and what we need to do is break that business model 
And so this is a plan that will, over time, it will reach a solution where we can break the business model of those absolutely atrocious gangs that trade in human misery. We've all seen those deaths in the channel uh, and those people coming to our shores. Okay, but what's, That's what what's, we need to deal clear with. Is, is that I, I don't understand about this. Is The UK Supreme Court website says that UK courts are not required always to follow the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Indeed, they can decline to do so particularly if they consider that the Strasbourg court has not sufficiently appreciated uh, particular aspects of our domestic constitutional position. So why do you need to go further? Well, because clearly we have seen a policy of a government that's elected with a democratic mandate to solve a very serious problem, such as illegal migration, being stopped by one anonymous European judge when every single court in our own country found that that was a legal, proportionate, compassionate and humane response to this very difficult global problem. The woman at the very back in the um, red top, yes. I've been involved in family law for 25 years and never have I been so concerned about the rule of law being undermined by a government in power. D is that of concern to anybody on the panel? And why, why are you so concerned? <laughs> I see those in power repeatedly, if they don't like decisions reached, trying to change things. What message does that give to our children as to how um, the rule of law operates in this country and in terms of how decision making should be made going forward in the interests of those people that they serve? Mm. Yeah, I think that most of us looked at the Strasbourg Court and thought it was a very positive um, safety mechanism um, to prevent the wrong thing happening. But I think somehow it's moved into a question of sovereignty. And I think most people have been, have been triggered into thinking about, do we really want Strasbourg making these decisions because it wasn't transparent? An awful lot of people have been talking about, you know, sort of who the judge was and they don't know who he is or whatever, or her. Um, I think that we have been we turn the issue into a sovereignty issue, whilst we should be much more worried about making sure that we can still ha hold our heads up high in the international world about this very, very important topic. Well, well, I, I worry about the Tory government. Every time they get a problem, they want to change the law or the regulations or put a new interpretation on it. I've got no... I don't think it is a sovereignty issue either. I think the Brexit was about sovereignty, but this is about standards and scrutiny. And I don't mind learned people with experience holding our own laws and our own uh, interpretation of laws and our own standards of conduct in relation to the way we treat other human beings, such as m people fleeing war and poverty. I don't mind that being subject to an open court of scrutiny where people say, look, think about this again. You need to think about the way you're treating people. You need to think about this issue, whether it's a values issue or a treatment of people issue. I'm happy for our country to be subject to that scrutiny, along with all the other countries that are signed up to this charter. It's a good charter, and I worry about people, Dominic Raab, like Dominic Raab, hiding things away from scrutiny so that they can get on with a bit of cooking the, uh, the issues to their own agenda, and I don't happy, like that. Are you happy with us not being able to deport foreign national criminals and, and rapists well, well, what I'm happy out of with our country that, that have entered illegally. That to scrutiny. Are you happy with that? We subject that to the scrutiny and standards. It is already, the, yes, the, it is. Well, that's, what, that's why we should keep the court as it is, then. OK. The, the, the guy there in the green shirt, yes. I think that's, that's so wrong because you're saying that all the people that are coming across are criminals and they're this and they're that. No, and no, they're I'm not. I never that's, said that's, that. That's, 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 that's so wrong. Words in my mouth. And, and Do not put words in my and, mouth. And furthermore... OK, it was an underhand deal done with a country that needs cash. And, you know, you, you've... It wasn't you, underhand. You, it's completely it, it, transparent. Because, because this, certainly, the because you've, you've, picked a, you've picked a country that isn't... You know, that isn't needs what? some help and needs some investment or whatever. Whatever deal you've struck and said, OK, we're going to move all of these people by plane to your country. They've had X amount of time to prepare a few hotels as a welcoming committee and or whatever. That's not going to fix the problem. Okay. You're not going to fix the problem that way. Do you want to answer that for a moment? Uh, yes, I, you've put words into my mouth and I'm going to push back on that because it's completely wrong. I never said that all the people that come to our country are coming illegally. I, you've, can I just... Can I, I, I asked the gentleman here whether he is happy that we cannot remove 
criminals from our country who well, have who come. Who said that? So he's not <laughs> happy. So we can't... Just I want it at standard. You asked me to answer the question. So OK, let, 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 subject let, to scrutiny. let's let Rachel answer the question. I want to fit more, one more question in before this programme ends. Every country around the world has the right to control who comes in or out of the country, right or wrong? Thank you. Okay. Every country... Right. Right. Control should be subject to international... Which okay. it is. We've got nine minutes more. I want to get one more question, because today is by-election day in two areas, and we have a question from Shirley Parry. If the Conservative Party lose today's two by-elections, will the Prime Minister be able to stay the course? Uh... Who should we go to first on this? Ben. Well, uh, the Prime Minister is under great pressure. You know, he claims he won the vote of no confidence in, in Parliament the other day, but 148 of his MPs voted against him, and he has a majority of 80. That means he doesn't actually command... The, the, the Conservatives may have a majority in the Commons, but he doesn't command that majority. There are 148 MPs who are against him. So, technically, yes, he won the vote, but in a practical sense, he doesn't command his majority. If he loses both seats today, I think he is vulnerable, but there'll be lots of excuses made about this being midterm and so on, and he'll fight on. I, I think the Prime Minister is actually politically, inc possibly fatally wounded already. Anne. Yeah, I think that um, what I think about the Prime Minister and whether the Prime Minister stays or not is not really relevant. I don't oh, think but we're Prime all Minister... interested to hear. <laughs> Come think... on, this is question time. I don't time. think that the um, Prime Minister um, intends to go anywhere. Yeah. So you think he will stay the course? Yeah. Whatever the I are. think that he will probably um, uh, sort of bide his time a little bit longer. OK. The woman in the glasses in the dark top there. Boris Johnson said today that the suggestion that he might resign after an electoral defeat was crazy. He says that the suggestion to resign after breaking law in office is crazy. What exactly will it take that isn't crazy in order for Boris Johnson to consider resignation? OK, you can think about that, Rachel, while I go around with the audience. Yes, the man there. No, the man, the man at, the, at the very back, yes. Um, considering we can't always trust what the Prime Minister says, um, and he might one day leave, um, who would be a good con uh, candidate in the Conservative Party to take over? Would anybody think from the panel? OK, and let's hear from the man in the blue shirt then. <laughs> yes. I think if Boris had any decency after the Sue Gray report and the public outcry, he would have already resigned. And I think, I find it amazing that he can look himself in the mirror and think, what a great job I've done. OK. <laughs> it's all coming from one director, but I know there are a lot of Conservative voters in, in our audience tonight. Have any of you got your hands up? OK, the woman here in the front. I think for all his faults, and everybody, every Prime Minister we've had has had plenty of faults, I think Boris has been doing a valiant job. He's coped with, as best he can, the pandemic, mm -hmm. Brexit, now Ukraine. He's got a lot of... He's had Covid himself. I think he deserves a little bit of loyalty. Mm. Okay. Do you agree with that, Mick? Well, I don't think being able to catch COVID is a particular qualification. <laughs> we'd, all, we'd all be able to do it. But, look, look, I hope... I hope... I hope I'm allowed to say this, Fiona. I hope he loses both of these elections and I hope he's undermined, frankly. That's what, you know, you, you wouldn't expect, expect anything else from me. But his main problem is he's unembarrassable. No matter what he does, he's not embarrassed by his failures, by the image he, put, he uh, gives off and by his behaviour. And he's supported by that, in that by his mates in the establishment. And we've got a very strange society where he's propped up by the press, propped up by the media, propped up by the city. And no matter what he does, no matter how badly he behaves, up to and including breaking the law, they won't go against him. And they've shown that in this vote. I think he was unsupportable even by Tories. But nevertheless, they lined their own nest and supported him. So I don't know what would make him go. But I think, ultimately, the Tories will get rid of him before the ballot box gets rid of him, because that's in their interests. He's not the only Prime Minister to do things like that. Tony Blair lied to Parliament, and yet he's been knighted. Well, Boris Johnson will get lauded, no doubt. Rachel, well, there's a lot of things Mick said there, potentially about you, feathering your own nest, 
No, I'm not feathering my own nest at all. But I think on the question of the by-elections, by obviously, by the time this programme goes out, I think probably the by-elections, the polls will have closed. They and, will definitely have closed, yes, and we wouldn't and, be having this and discussion. people <laughs> won't have to wait very long to find out what the results are. So, look, I think uh, the basic point is that by-elections are not a particularly good indicator of, of anything, really, over the long term. They, they've been won and lost, and governments have come and gone. Uh, the only poll that actually matters is the one at the general election. People will have the chance to express their views on the Prime Minister and his record, and people have different views. We've seen that in the audience tonight. We've seen that every time I go out and talk to the general public. So and the question is, if the Conservative Party lose both by-elections, will Boris Johnson be able to stay the course? Yes, or yes no? he will. I believe he will stay the course, and I believe he will take us into the next election. OK, Nick. He, he shouldn't uh, stay the course, and he should already have uh, resigned. But I, I've been up to Wakefield several times, and uh, Rachel may dismiss the views of people there as somehow irrelevant. I don't. I've the views, to them. They're the very views, nice. The views of people on the doorstep there that I've heard about Boris Johnson were extremely angry. People who themselves had made sacrifices during the pandemic, not gone to the bedside of dying relatives, not visited elderly relatives in care homes, people who'd not attended funerals. And all that time, Boris Johnson was presiding over, frankly, mass law breaking in Downing Street. It is quite appalling. If the man had any shame, he'd have gone. Okay, there's applause and groans in equal measure coming from the audience. Yeah, the man there in the, in the middle in the sort of dark red shirt with black top. Yes. Is, is Boris Johnson likely to stay the course just due to the fact that there are no significantly credible and experienced candidates to take his position? Since the Brexit vote, we've lost David Cameron, we lost Osborne, we, Theresa May um, tried her best but was hamstrung into being able to implement what she wanted to do. And is it now that there is in, insufficient experience within the Conservative Party to, to lead a country? OK. Jacob breeds mock is credible, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> the, the man in the blue suit and white shirt there, yes. I agree with that last comment. I think he hasn't got a credible um, person to replace him. Plus, where is Sir Keir Starmer? We haven't mentioned him once tonight, and I don't believe he has many, enough policies to be able to... Um, jeopardise what Boris is doing. OK, let's have two quick responses from either of those. Rachel. There's plenty of talent in the Conservative Party. You, you know, you? you, you no, 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 not in a zillion years. OK, Keir Starmer, we haven't I mentioned do, him. Where I, is he? Well, Keir Starmer is a person of integrity, and here's the difference. Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer has said if he receives a fixed penalty notice from Durham Police, he'll do the right thing and step down. How refreshing a contrast that is to the way the Prime Minister's behaved. Okay. We'll know the glasses and the scarf. Um, my grandmother died during the start of the pandemic. We didn't see her for the last five weeks of her life. I'm very I sorry I have voted Conservative all of my adult life, but quite frankly, at the moment, after the behaviour of the government, led by Boris Johnson, there is no way in a million... <clears throat> excuse me, no way in a million years that they would get my vote at the moment. So how do you get her vote back? He, people make decisions on voting all the time and sometimes people don't come back, but other people come on. That's democracy. But how could you people, persuade that, that lady then? I, I honestly don't know. I'd have to have a very long conversation with that lady and she might, she might have completely made her mind up and that's the nature of what we do as politicians. Very often people won't vote for us, but that's fine. It's democracy. Well, yes, but she was a Tory voter and, and is now saying she, she's not she going to vote for She was, and of course we accept that. We, we can't get everybody's votes all the time. We work really hard and we, we explain what we're doing and I've set out what I believe, okay. and she doesn't agree with it. I'm actually one of your constituents, Rachel, so I would quite like to have that conversation. We will do that, I'm sure. Tomorrow in the Kingfisher. <laughs> I've got about ten seconds left. What woman in there in, the, in a sort of beige shirt, is it? Um, this week, there's another story about Boris Johnson, this time when he was at FCO, trying to get his, his part... Office. Yeah, when he was trying to get his partner a uh, £100,000 a year job. It's an allegation, it's an unproven it, allegation. Well, they're allegation after out. allegation, story after story. It's been months of this. How are you not embarrassed that he's your leader? Well, OK. A final word, a final word, then I'll, I must end the programme. People can make allegations, that doesn't mean they're true. OK. Lots of you with your hands up, but I'm afraid we are out of time, so I'm going to have to end the programme there. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening, to all of you for coming along to the programme, and, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Stratford-upon-Avon. Bye-bye.